is perfectly appropriate in Presbyterian worship when the choir shares really significant good news to give them an amen. 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 The Gospel reading is from the fifth chapter of the Gospel according to Matthew. It's actually printed in your bulletin today. Um, and it's printed in your bulletin because um, Jesus is making things hard for us once again. Um, uh, there goes Jesus making things hard for us once again. Um, so it's printed in your bulletin so you can follow along. I'm going to begin uh, with verse 38, chapter 5. Jesus said, You have heard that it was said, An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist an evildoer. But if anyone strikes you on the right cheek, turn the other also. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your coat, give your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go also the second mile. Give to everyone who begs from you. And do not refuse anyone who wants to borrow from you. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be children of your Father in heaven. For he makes the sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers and sisters, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. This is the word of the Lord. Would the children come and join me up here on the chancel? Come on up, everybody up on top, Addie. Okay, all right. Um, so I want to ask you a question. Do you have any friends? You do? You do? Good job. I'm so glad you have friends. I have friends too. One of them is right behind you, and I think she's your friend too, Pastor Jesse. Um, so, so all of us, all four of us up here, Pastor Jesse, do you have friends? Okay, so we all have friends. So what do we do when um, we have a friend? What do we do to show them we are their friend? What do you think? You can say hi when you see a friend. What kinds of things do we do to show our friends that we love them? like at their birthday. What could we do at their birthday? Any ideas? We could give them a present. Do you like presents? I, I actually, I love presents. So when my friends give me pre presents, that's great. Or cards, or cake. Cake with candles on top. So, we all know how to deal with friends. Do we know how to deal with enemies? Do you have any enemies? Do you have any enemies? You don't. Okay, do we know how to deal with enemies? We have any idea how to deal with enemies? So do we, do we bring them cake? Enemies. Do we bring cake to enemies? 
Not usually. Do we bring them cards or presents? Okay. All right. So here's the thing about enemies. Jesus says this really strange thing. You're supposed to love them. Do we love our enemies? No. No, we don't. Generally, we don't. Generally, we do exactly what Jesus says not to do. So, I'm wondering if the two of you could do me a really big favor, because you are my friends, and you could play pretend with us, okay? So, Pastor Jesse is your enemy. Look, she looks so mad. She's your enemy, and I'm your enemy. Ah! And if you were going to love us, what would you do? So now you're going to have to move. What would you do if you would love us even though we're your enemies? You might give us a hug. That's one idea. Could one of you give me a hug? Because I'm feeling very alone. Oh, thank you. Thank you. And Pastor Jessie's feeling alone too. She's your enemy, but go give her a hug. Oh, fist bump. That's great. All right. The fact is, it's hard to think about loving our enemies. It's hard even for adult people, right? It's hard for adult people to think about loving our enemies. Is it not? Yes? Okay. But that's what Jesus asks us to do. Can we come down on the floor and we're going to have a prayer together? I'm going to take your hand here. And let's get you in too. And all of you can pray with us. Dear God. Dear God. We thank you for friends, and we thank you for enemies. Ask, uh, uh, help us, help to, us. Love to love our friends, and to love our enemies. Amen. Amen. Thank you. And I think you guys are going with Mrs. McAvoy. Let us pray. Gracious and holy God, pour your Holy Spirit upon us, that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts might be acceptable in your sight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. When I was a teenager, I read a lot of Harlequin romances. For a teenage girl interested in the opposite sex, these books were simultaneously exciting and comforting. The plot was always the same. You could tell by the end of the first chapter in every single volume who would end up with whom. Boy meets girl, boy loses girl, boy gets girl in the end. It was predictable. Comfortingly, predictable. The men in the books were always honorable and good-looking. The women were always honorable and good-looking. Love between one of them was something that took them by storm, that swept away any control they thought they had. They realized in every single book that they had never felt this way before. And at the end, they were always, always on the road to get married and to live happily ever after. Grown-up fairy tales with some excitement along the way and a predictable, happy ending, that's what these books were selling. Reading these books gave a warm and cozy sense of the meaning and order of love, the logic of love. Love would be meant to be. You would just know when you met the right person. It would be rainbows and moonbeams, hearts and flowers. And it would be in some wonderfully organized and sensible way, it would be transactional. Love would be transactional. 
You would give something and you would get something. And what you would give and what you would get would be equal. An equal exchange of goods and services. And the whole exercise would make you feel complete, whole, full, intact, like your life had turned out exactly how it was supposed to. It would be logical. It would make sense. It would have come out right. You would be happy. In truth, love in the real world is different than in the pages of a Harlequin romance I have found. Just a bit different. Love, real love, is hard. It includes pain, sacrifice, difficulty, and work. To love is to work hard, to commit. It is to strive to work out the inevitable problems that come with relating to that pesky, annoying species, you know, human beings. Whether the love is the romantic variety between spouses or partners, or the love of a parent for a child, or a child for a parent, or siblings, or cousins, extended family, or dear friends, in every one of these, we have to learn forgiveness. We have to study how to forgive and how to accept forgiveness. We have to learn confession how to realize where we were wrong, and how to accept forgiveness. It turns out that love is not transactional. Oh, sure, we, we do get something out of it, but often, even in the most lasting, loving relationships, we have to commit to loving, even when, especially when, Nothing is offered in return. When a loved one is sick or disabled or going through challenges, to love means to be steadfast. It means to continue to love, to remember how to love even when nothing is offered in return. Love is a lot of hard work. And that's among those whom we love, whom we want to love. Just imagine what it would, might be like to love people who don't love us back. People who, in fact, hate us, who wish us ill, who want to hurt us, to control us, to deny us freedom and happiness and life. This is the quirky and incomprehensible thing about Jesus, about Jesus' call to us. Jesus calls us to risk to love. To risk to love those who are committed to our destruction, who are planning evil against us. These people are enemies. They do not inspire love in us. They inspire fear. Suspicion, contempt, hatred. On the national and international stage, we write laws. We pass legislation to make sure that these people, these people who do not love us, we pass laws that ensure that they cannot get close to us, that our enemies have to stay far, far away so that we can be safe from our enemies. We plan for and fund a strong defense, and we kick out people or we bar them from entering these people who might be our enemies. As our president tells us that there is much to fear and that danger is imminent, we respond by increasing our vigilance and keeping our guard up. And as the saying goes, if you see something, say something. Nationally and internationally, we strive. We put much energy and time and money behind efforts to stop our enemies, and if necessary, to attack our enemies before they attack us. We 
are well versed in the art and science of securing ourselves from our enemies. But what if we were called to love our enemies? What if we were called to pray for them? To love them as the signature by which people would know us as Jesus' followers? And what if, what if, horror of horrors, what if our enemies were much closer and didn't wear identifying clothing nor speak other languages? For the enemy without, the one beyond our borders, the enemy we've never met, it is hard to conceive of loving that one, that faceless, nameless person who will always be an abstraction, a cipher to us. But, my friends, it's actually easier to think about loving them in that abstract, intangible way, loving someone who we have never met and whom we will never meet. But what if the enemy we are called to love and to pray for is someone we know, who has a name and a face we recognize? Then this call of Jesus would be difficult indeed. Because there is no way that the transactional, orderly, good-feeling love between people that we long for, that makes sense to us, that ends in happily ever after, there is no way that loving that one you know as your enemy, that one who knows you as their enemy, there is no way that loving that one is going to make any sense at all. And yet, this is what Jesus means. This is what following Jesus means. This is, in fact, how we become children of God, how we are known as Jesus' followers in the world. This kind of love, love that extends even to enemies, this is revolutionary. It is transformative. It changes us from the outside in and from the inside out. If we accept this call, it will change the way we understand life, the way we understand love. Love then would become not something that happens to us, but rather the very, the very way we experience being alive. So the order, the logic, the sense we make of life, it, it would be all founded in the creative, inspirational, and transformational power of love. And in this life, this life founded on the amazing power and grace of life, life would be intensified. It would be made complete and full and whole as we grew farther and further into the call of Jesus to love, we would find that we would come to understand the world and all who love the world differently. We would come to an understanding and an experience of being human that is more and bigger and brighter and different than the life we knew before. This makes the relationship with those we love differently, different because our understanding of love would be so very different. And eventually, as we would grow more mature, as we would grow up and practiced in the ways of life founded in love, it would make love of enemies not only possible, but life-giving. God has put us on the earth in communities. We do not live alone, most of us. Most people are not living as hermits far from other people. God has put us here in community. And God has allowed those of us who follow Jesus to gather in groups 
called congregations, in which we get to practice these skills, these habits of living lives founded in love. So that we can offer the transformational power of such a life that we learn and we practice here within these walls to the people outside the church. But, but when the people of God, we, we friends who follow Jesus, when we find our enemies inside the church, we lose our way. We lose the ability and the grace to understand life in the way of Christ. St. Paul imagined us all as a body, the body of Christ, and each one a member of that body. So if the eye has an enemy in the foot, or an elbow has an enemy in the forehead, the whole body will be sick, diseased, dysfunctional. Our understanding of ourselves is bound up and profoundly affected by our understanding of the relationship that we have with other people. We learn to be ourselves from how we relate to others. And the decisions we make about love and our approach to love, our willingness to risk loving, or our decision to play it safe, to avoid love, those will speak to all we meet of our understanding of life and how we comprehend love. Trappist monk Thomas Merton, who wrote whole books on the nature of love, Thomas Merton said that genuine love is a personal revolution. It transforms our entire life. Real love, he said, takes your ideas, your dreams, your desires, and your actions and welds them together in one experience and one living reality, which is the new you. And, Merton said, you may prefer to stop this from happening. Let me repeat that. Brother Merton said, you may prefer to stop this from happening. Merton had discerned the truth that we can choose. We can choose the foundation of our life. We can choose love as that foundation and, or, we can choose differently. We might choose not to be changed. We might choose not to risk, not to be part of the revolution. We might say, you know what, the old me is just fine, thank you very much. I'm not particularly interested. I don't think I want to become a whole new me. The old me suits me. I'm comfortable with the old me, and I am not looking to change. So if we're not looking to change, if we're not interested in the revolution, if we see transformation as something which all things being equal, we would just rather not do, we can make that choice. That is the grace of God to us. We have been endowed by our creator with free will. And if we make that choice, we have to accept the result of that choice. My sisters and brothers, if we make that choice not to accept love as the foundation of our life, not to risk loving even our enemies, we can never get to where Jesus is calling us to be. And friends, isn't that why we're here? Why would we waste 
perfectly beautiful Sunday mornings and Wednesday evenings and Thursday afternoons and so many other times throughout a week or a month or a year. Why would we do that? It doesn't make any sense. Why would we be here if not to open ourselves to what Jesus is doing? and where Jesus is calling, and to expose ourselves to the new life, the new life founded in love, which makes our life something more, bigger, brighter, more intense, and teaches us more of what it means to be human, the definition of which for disciples, for we who follow Jesus, is to love. My friends, this is my last day with you. I have learned from you. I have laughed with you. I have cried with you. And I have received love from you you. Today I am sad and I am hopeful. I'm sad to go and I am hopeful about your future. Because I have seen a multitude of signs that Jesus is active in this place that the Spirit is working here, that lives are being changed through the ministry of this congregation, thanks be to God. My prayer for you as I go is that you will continue to grow in your openness to Jesus' call to love, that you might find ways to love each other, even especially when it is hard. Yes, I know, and you know, and we know, it will not be easy. It will take all you have, and it will change you. With you, I pray that we all will grow in our ability to risk, to love. For that, my friends, will make all the difference. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Jesus knows who we are. It's kind of scary. Jesus knows our good points, and Jesus knows our faults. And Jesus loves us. Amen? Amen. Because we know that to be true, we respond by returning some portion of what Jesus has blessed us with for our lives. Let us respond to Jesus' love with our tithes and offerings. Generous God, in grace you freely give, and in love you joyfully command us to imitate you. 
Let these gifts bear witness to the justice for which you long and offer a faithful response to the loving care that you have first given us in your law, your prophets, and your son. Amen. A couple of concerns we want to share with you as we turn to God in prayer. The first is that uh, former associate pastor, uh, Patrick Cherry, their son um, Liam has been hospitalized. Um, this isn't the first time their son has severe food allergies, um, but he is requesting prayers and so we offer those prayers up uh, for their family. We also pray for Cynthia and her family who is here with her this morning as they begin a new part of their journey, um, discerning uh, God's will uh, for the ministry ahead. So our prayers surround you and to go with you. I invite you this morning to respond to each, each intercession. I will say loving God and you will respond, hear our prayer. Let us pray. Oh God, we pray for your church in all the world this day. Loving God, hear our prayer. Make your church secure in its foundation of Christ, ending divisions that hurt only our witness to your love. And bring us, oh God, to unity of mission to all the world for the sake of the gospel. For our pastors, teachers, and ministers, loving God, hear our prayer. Please be with the servants of your church. We pray for Pastor Cynthia and her family in the road ahead, for discernment of your call and a multitude of peace. We pray for our session. May they discern your will for this congregation and for the deacons as they continue to care for members and friends. For, and for all who journey in this congregation, O oh God, we pray for our mission co-workers serving in Peru, Jed and Jenny Koble, and for Jan Heckler serving in Madagascar. For the world and its leaders, loving God, hear our prayer. Uphold the leaders of governments for the work of peace. We pray for President Trump, for Governor Kasich, and for all who hold office and for those who support them provoke their hearts to compassion and make them agents of reconciling justice among all your people. We pray this day for our planet, this universe and the world that you have created. Loving God, hear our prayer. Sustain the earth, our home, and for the flourishing of all, of all who live upon it. Increase our knowledge of it, that we may be good stewards of its abundance. For the poor and the refugee, loving God, hear our prayer. Assist the poor in their need, protect the refugees as they sojourn, and make your church a refuge for those in want. For those who are sick and in distress, loving God, hear our prayer. Heal all those who are sick in body and mind or in spirit. Comfort them in their pain and restore all to a wholeness of life. And finally, O oh God, we pray for our enemies, loving God hear our prayer. Bless those who hate us and give us courage to refuse retaliation and make us instruments of your reconciling love. These prayers we offer through Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit and pray together the prayer he taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread 
and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As we turn to uh, lead worship in our final hymn, I wanted to share a couple of announcements about our life together. The first is that immediately following worship, we'll have a reception for Cynthia, a celebration of her ministry among us in the fellowship hall. We invite you to join us. Um, additionally, next week Sunday after worship, we will have a Mardi Gras pancake brunch uh, and fundraiser for those who are going on the mission trip to Peru. Um, and that will also be in the fellowship hall. And during that time, we'll be, we will be Skyping in our mission coworkers, Jed and Jenny Koble, to hear more about the ministry there. So let us stand and join in our final hymn. a season and a time for every matter under heaven. God of every yesterday and 
Jesus says, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not let them be afraid. For the joy shared, Thank you, Lord. for the hurts caused, Forgive us, Lord. and for new beginnings, Let bless us. the Lord. Jesus calls us to love, and Jesus meant it. So let's learn to love, and let's start here. Now may the grace and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.